each year as we've continued to evolve, to evolve um, in our industry, we want to make sure that we always keep in mind, we talk a lot about science and we talk a lot about money and we talk about innovation and, you know, it's about people. It's about patients. It's about finding diseases that used to um, end lives and hopefully instead end the disease. Well, this year we celebrate an anniversary and it goes back to 1954 when the sock vaccine was tested at Arsenal Elementary School in the Watson Home for Children in Pittsburgh. And this was then used and called in a test called the Francis Field Trial, which was the largest single pharmaceutical drug trial ever done. And by the end, 444,000 children had been vaccinated against polio. And a disease that had been one of the greatest fears of every parent started to dramatically drop until today um, you know, we see very, very, very low but not total eradication of the disease. So um, this conversation actually started when Dave Larward and I were having a conversation at um, Biotech Showcase in San Francisco. And I said, David, why do you have crutches? And this is what he told me. He said, you know, Joan, I've never had any memory of running or even walking normally. My dad was a medical missionary in Korea, and in 1955, my dad and I got polio. David's father continued to get weaker. David is amazing in the things that he's done, and I've watched the videos. But David is going to share his experience today um, in working with people around the world and with the Rotary Organization and others, but more importantly on what it's like to be a polio survivor, because he's not the only one. There's a lot of them out there. We also have with us um, Debbie McCune Davis. And Debbie is the executive director for the Arizona Partnership for Immunization, which we also call TAPI, which at the end of the day makes it a lot easier on me. And Debbie oversees this public-private partnership that works to meet Healthy People 2020 goals, which are critical goals for our state, in raising immunization coverage letters. Since 1996, she's also used this knowledge in the community um, to prevent to vaccine again, to make sure that we're vaccinating against preventable diseases, which she says is actually a much easier job than the other part-time job that she has, which is service as an elected member of the Arizona House of Representatives. More rewarding, <laughs> but no less important. Um, so we're really, really pleased to have both David and, De and Debbie with us today. But, you know, I reached out to GSK and Gaspar and said, you know, you guys are the biggest vaccine company in the world. And I would really love to have someone talk to my panel of experts that knows a little bit more about the importance of these discussions than I do. And so Gaspar said, like all of our leaders do in Arizona, how can I help? And now you see, he's moderating the panel. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David, Gaspar, and Debbie. Thank you, Joan. As uh, Joan went through the introductions, uh, GlaxoSmithKline is one of five only vaccine manufacturers uh, in, in the world. And so you'll get a sense of the importance of uh, immunization as these two individuals talk more about uh, vaccine preventable diseases. But we're here to talk uh, a little bit about polio. And I think everybody in this room can remember that in the 40s and 50s, uh, polio was at the fear of every parent. 
Uh, I too have been touched by polio, not personally, but I do have a first cousin who has polio and is about 62 years of old now. And I remember having the same conversation with her as David and Joan as to why are you on crutches? Uh, and so very interesting dynamic as a little boy. But with the advent of the SOC vaccine and the efforts of healthcare and community experts around the world, uh, that has changed. You know, we've made a tremendous progress, uh, but certainly the job is not done. So David, uh, as a polio survivor, can you take us back with a short history and also share a bit of polio survivors living in the U.S. today? Thank you, Gasper, and uh, thank you, Joan, as well. Um, so I had polio, as she said, in 1955. I want to talk a little bit about the disease and a little bit about my experiences with the disease. Uh, the disease was known uh, in ancient times. There are pictures from the Egyptians that show people with crippled limbs that we, that, we, that we believe are from polio. Polio was identified as an active agent in, uh, in about 1850 or so, and in 1906, or in 1910 period, they, they identified the active agent. Uh, polio was not a big problem until people started moving into the cities and the hygiene started getting better. And the presumption is that there was some exposure on the farms or in the communities that led to early mild exposures and, and, the, and you didn't have the, the bursts of, of, uh, of infection you know, spreading. So polio is a virus that lives in the gut, the mouth and the gut. And so you transfer it if you're handling a child who, uh, who changing their diapers is a classic way that people get, di get, uh, get polio these days. And, and then you brush your face and then it gets into you. And the problem with polio is that it, that it lives for, it lives in the person for up to two or three months. It's typically about 10 days, but uh, it lives in, in, the, in the body and spreads to the lymph nodes, gets into the blood in a very small number of people, about 1% of infected cases, it gets into the central nervous system or the CNS. So if you see anybody carrying crutches, they're in that 1%. So that means a lot of people were, past, were, were infected uh, and, and merely transmitting the virus. So you can't tell the people who are merely, tra merely transmitting um, about 10% of people uh, who are infected have active disease, expression of disease, they have the fever and such, but it's still not in the central nervous system. Uh, people who have the, the disease can be, can be paralyzed within days of getting the infection. It can happen quite fast. Uh, for me, it was about 10 days. It was obvious pretty quickly that I had polio. My father was a medical missionary in Korea, so he was used to dealing with polio people. And uh, he, in fact, came down with the disease at almost the same time. And for a period of time, I thought maybe he'd gotten it from taking care of me, protecting my mother, but he said, no, no, he was in contact with other people in the community. It's most likely uh, other patients in the hospital. Uh, it's most likely that he and I went to a swimming pool and, and got the disease there. So the disease was, was particularly scary in the 40s and 50s, uh, but in the, in the 30s and such, there was all, it, it goes back to the, to the 20s, as soon as people started moving into the cities. So what's it like? So if you see pictures, the, the, the infections that you see now are, are really tragic. It's very easy to solve this with um, uh, a vaccination. The vaccination that's used now, the Sabin vaccine, is a partially, uh, uh, partially harmed live virus. The Salk vaccine was a killed virus, and it was, it was effective, but you had to have booster shots. The sugar cubes and the little drops that they use now, uh, they give an actual live virus, which challenges the, the human. So the, the, they were suppressing cases quite well. Uh, in, in 2012, there were only 280 cases reported. Last year, there were twice that. And it turns out that there's, a, there's an outburst of polio, particularly in Somalia and Ethiopia, a little bit in Pakistan. Uh, and uh, this got people very scared because the, the Rotary has been raising uh, $3 million, uh, 3 or $4 million. The, the Gates Foundation has more than matched that. Uh, to do a huge eradication. The, the expenditure for immunization is on the order of $2 billion uh, and it's still not gone. And there's cultural reasons for that. There's a lot of, of other challenges. Um, basically, if you see the people, the, the classic picture is of a child or an older person who has a, a shriveled leg uh, using some sort of a stick for walking. Well, these are, these are nothing much more than a fancier stick. Um, I have a rigid device which, uh, which stabilizes my leg, which is also used for, for people that have walking issues. So there's better technology in curing, uh, there's, uh, in treating, but, but the reason I don't have a leg that's as shriveled as theirs is because in Western medicine they exercise it. You know, they said you're going to get a shriveled leg if you don't do this, that, these exercises every day for you know, certainly all of my growing up time. So that's just a little touch of, of, of what it's like. Thank you, David. 
Now, Debbie, you, uh, aside from your public service, you also lead the largest statewide immunization coalition that uh, is in the forefront of educating parents, adults, about vaccine-preventable diseases. Can you give us some examples of the work that TAPI is doing in our state? I can, Gaspar, and um, David's story really sets up the perfect uh, background for this conversation. Smallpox was eradicated. Polio was almost eradicated, and we're still working on it. But measles was the disease that frightened people in uh, the late 90s, or, yeah, late 80s, early 90s. And there was a national initiative across the country that challenged states to do a better job, not just um, having vaccines available, but making certain that children were getting the benefit of them. And that's when my organization was created. I didn't join the organization until 1996, but it was actually started in 93. And uh, the objective is to build a sustainable program throughout the state to protect our citizens against vaccine-preventable disease, which means that we follow a schedule developed by the Advisory Council on Immunization Practices, which is a national group, that um, identifies vaccines as they are created and produced by um, companies like GSK, and then builds them into an integrated schedule so that when children are born, as they see the doctor, they get the vaccines that are appropriate for them at that stage of life. And this strategy has worked. Across the country, kids are now protected against polio at an average rate of 92.8%. That's how many kids in our country actually get the benefit of polio vaccine. And, uh, and uh, that wasn't always the case, because what was happening is the vaccines were available, but they weren't integrated into medical practice in a way that children got the benefit. Doctors, when I first started with this project, told me, oh, I'd love to vaccinate every child in my practice, but the parents just don't bring them back in on time. So we created a system for, to make it easy for physicians to remind their patients to get their kids back in on time, two months, four months, six months, nine months, a year, until they're up to date, which can, is supposed to be done, that initial series at uh, 24 months, and then we've protected them against diseases that are now almost invisible in our society. But that's where the story gets interesting, because our young parents, don't see the threats anymore. They don't see the diseases. How many of you here have ever seen a case of measles? It would be exactly the same reaction if I had a group of physicians. The vaccines have been so successful that they are no, the diseases are no longer perceived as threats. And so parents uh, think they have choices related to vaccines. So what does my organization do? We bring together from organizations across the state, public health, private health um, partners, and advocacy groups, and we work to implement best practices so that every child born in Arizona gets the full benefit of vaccines so that we don't have the consequences that uh, are very expensive in our medical uh, community and very expensive in terms of how it affects people in their day-to-day -day lives. So, um, our objective is to maintain what is called herd immunity. And the concept of herd immunity is pretty simple. If you had a herd of cattle and you were able to vaccinate all of them against a, disease, a preventable disease, that disease has nowhere to go. With these particular diseases and these vaccines, the general rule of thumb is 90 to 95%. If you can maintain a 90% immunization coverage level in your community, disease has nowhere to spread because one person might get the disease, but it doesn't become an epidemic. It doesn't become an outbreak. And so that slowly dies off, and, that, and we have seen that happen. And we're now challenged because the people who are objecting to vaccines and using exemptions, and we can talk more about that as our conversation goes on, are now creating pockets and pools of individuals where the vaccine um, doesn't protect the population and the diseases can take hold and can spread. And that's really where we find ourselves today. So I started this job hoping I would work myself out of a job. 
hasn't happened yet. I'm still working on it. Thank you, Debbie. So, so David, um, you've worked with, uh, um, you have a relationship with other polo, uh, is it, you don't say polio survivors, do you? Is that the terminology? Some, some people say that, post-polio okay. is. Post-polio, okay. Uh, and you've seen changes in our healthcare system. Uh, what can we do in order to raise the visibility that people should get immunized, especially for a vaccine-preventable disease? Uh, interesting question. I'm going to go a couple different ways, just, just touch on a couple things lightly. Uh, a lot of people who have survived polio, there's, there's a bit of camaraderie between the people that have survived it uh, and, you know, how are you doing and, and, and such. Uh, the disease, uh, it's kind of like a wildfire going through, so you don't know if it's going to go over this mountain and what the, what the extent of the disease is going to be. So my father has all of his limbs impacted, so my most frequent contact with a polio survivor is my father, uh, who's in a wheelchair, he uses a walker, it's very hard for him to get around. Uh, through some other things that I do in the Bay Area, I ran into a, uh, I was, there's a YouTube clip of me interviewing a person who was work, working with some polio survivors. And there are groups of people that get together and tell stories about you know, where you can get exercises and services. And so there's a community that spends time trying to help each other get through these things. Um, I was a little dismayed in that some of the people seemed like just they wanted a place to weep and moan, mm -hmm. uh, which is unfortunate because in the course of getting my brace repaired and, and well, let me tell you briefly about post-polio. Uh, when I went to college in Southern California, I realized that I could walk barefoot if I didn't wear my brace. So I said, I'm getting rid of that brace. And I had, I, you know, I, when I grew up, I couldn't walk across the room without either hopping, using my crutches, or a brace. And so to, to cast away my brace in, in college was an amazing and dramatic thing. Uh, in my late 40s, um, I started having trouble walking. I couldn't walk long distances, and so I went back to using a brace. And so I got very uh, connected with the brace community. I've, I've been in, in medical-related industries for a long time, so the process of therapeutics and medical devices I find very, very interesting. So the technology that's available for bracing is really quite phenomenal. And what I hear from my orthopedic surgeon friends who have treated a lot of polio people uh, is that there's an incredible resiliency um, and energy in post-polio people. Uh, many of them are take no prisoners, you know, take no prisoners, just charge that hill, go out and do things. And that's a, that's a very exciting space. So there's a, there's a few people who, you know, grouse, but most people are pretty enthusiastic. And you asked also about, you know, what can we do to, to, to uh, prevent this or encourage others? Um, telling stories. This is what it's like. You do not want your child to have polio. You do not want your child to have polio. You do not want your child to have measles. You don't want your, have your, your child to have any of these diseases. Right. Not only your child, but your grandparents who may have put off doing this for all these years. Thank you. Well, Debbie, I mean, your organization is, again, trying to educate the public. What can these individuals do to possibly help your organization to spread the word about uh, immunizations, vaccines for, for preventable diseases? Well, clearly hearing the stories of people who are impacted are the most compelling way to, um, to share with people. And, and if you think about it, there are stories in our families. My grandmothers, one on each side of the family, lost an infant in infancy, probably to pneumonia, which some strains are now preventable with vaccines, but our longevity is improved because we have the benefit of vaccines and we don't see uh, people with the same kind of mobility problems. But we need to really bring out those stories and repeat them often enough that people are reminded of just what, can, what happens when these diseases are prevalent. Because it, you know, we all talk about saving money and we all talk about the importance of research. But we have to meld those ideas together. Not only do we have to acknowledge the marvelous work being done in laboratories across the country to find cures for disease, but when we can prevent them, we have to use the technology we have to make sure that our kids get the benefit of that. And there are some real opportunities out there. There are some real missed opportunities. And I'll talk about one. And you know, it's not, um, you know, polio is so interesting because the risks from polio are emerging, frankly, from other countries where government is breaking down. And the public health programs that have been in place are no longer delivering the vaccines to the infants. And those children are now moving up generation by generation without the protections that previous children have had. 
So they are creating a risk factor for all of us because our borders are, are going away. But there are also vaccines out there that are um, perfectly ready to be rolled out through the community. And things like old wives' tales are preventing people from getting them. Thank you, Debbie. Well, as, uh, as we've spent some time talking about polio, and certainly there's a number of other vaccine preventable diseases, we've touched a lot on children, uh, but certainly as adults, uh, an emerging, emerging disease even here in our community is pertussis. And we don't think about that disease until you probably become a grandparent or a grandfather as an adult. But in closing remarks, uh, can you actually say something before? Uh, I'll go to each one of you to say something that this panel can walk away and said they've spent 25 minutes very wisely. <laughs> one of the interesting things about um, a disease is if you see a sick person, uh, that you respond to that. If you see a person who didn't get sick because of the preventable disease, it's completely different perception. So when the early vaccines came out and grandpa would get the polio virus, get polio from handling the, handling the child, suddenly, oh, grandpa got sick because of such and such, and you don't have a sensitivity of the, of the community that's protected. So it, it's hard, it's just a hardwired thing in the brain. How do you teach right. that? And I think having examples of people that, you know, there but for the grace of God go I um, are, are useful things. And we should just keep the, the awareness up and encourage parents to get vaccinated. Debbie? And we discovered with pertussis, which you all would, re, would recall as a whooping cough, which most of us believed was no longer around anymore, just like um, polio, just like smallpox. It's reemerged. And in these cases, the infants who are most vulnerable to the disease get it from their caregivers, from their mothers, their grandmothers, their grandfathers, or whoever is um, asymptomatic but carrying the disease, may have a cough that just didn't go away. Uh, there are vaccines that adults can and should get to protect the generations that follow them, and that's really important. But there's one more really big thing, and that is that those of you who live and work and are comfortable in the world of science really have to take on conversation about vaccine exemptions. People who choose not to vaccinate and exempt themselves from school requirements because they're taking advantage of those of us who do vaccinate because they have the benefit of that herd immunity, and yet they leave their own children vulnerable. We have to talk about why it's important that we all vaccinate our kids, because we need to maintain those high levels. We've had our exemption rate double in the last um, eight years in Arizona, and it's, and it's because some people believe they understand vaccines, but really don't understand the consequences to the community as a whole. Thank you. Thank you both for this discussion. Uh, I turn it back to Joan. <laughs>